It is the 27th day of January 2015. I'm Kamene Goro, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you here with us today on Ebru African News this afternoon as we take a short look at what's happening in the world today. Without anything further, let's hop straight to it. In our top story, a section of members of parliament from Narok County have condemned yesterday's chaotic protests in the town. Now, the MP say that Narok Senator, Senator Stephen Ntutu and Governor Samuel Tunai should end their supremacy battles. Now, the MP say that those who organized yesterday's protests should take full responsibility of the deaths and the injuries that occurred. Now, the protesters were demonstrating against Governor Samuel Ole Tunai, whom they have accused of mishandling the county government. What our colleagues are doing it's unfortunate because it is really the culture of impunity coming back again in a big way. It's the issue of corruption because if we don't uh, oil their hands, their ways, then therefore uh, they, they, they will do whatever it is. It's we have had on several occasions try to call for a round table where we all sit and try and resolve the issues facing our county, but our colleagues chose to go the anarchy way of going back to Wanainchi to incite them to violence, rather than have us sit down and find a common ground where we can resolve our issues. It has even gone to a point where the President has called for a roundtable dialogue and our colleagues have refused. I think it's, it's high time that our colleagues led by the Senator really come out clean to tell us what other interest it is they have, because if it is the interest of the Wanainchi of Narok, then surely we can resolve those issues. Uh, if we start together. Moving on, the government has suspended Molimu Sako's bid to acquire Equatorial Commercial Bank. Now, Commissioner of Cooperatives Patrick Musiemi has appointed an inquiry team to probe the deal. The giant cooperative Alliance of Kenya Movement has registered its protest as to how the transaction was handled. The move comes after the SACO announced that it had paid 1.6 billion shillings for a 51% stake. Now, Molimu SACO was eyeing an additional 24% shareholding in the Equatorial Commercial Bank with plans to offload some of the controlling stake to members. Now, the SACO movement in Kenya is one of the top 10 globally and one that draws huge membership from across the country. Now, most of Senegal lies within the drought-prone Sahel region with irregular rainfall and generally poor soils. Now, despite the lack of modernization of artisanal fishing, the fishing sector remains Senegal's main economic resource and a major foreign exchange earner. Now, the fishermen are now facing what they call unfair competition challenges. Have a look. The fishing sector is on the economic and social plan one of the most important activities in Senegal. It generates approximately 6,000 direct jobs. In this village, for example, fishing is very important and a source of income for the population living here. Every day, people have just one activity to do, and that is to go fishing. We have a satisfaction in our work, even if everything is not stable to some extent. Sometimes we can sell a credit to 100,000. But others are very concerned about the foreign boats that are starting to invade their area and they think that this is the cause of difficulties that they face today. This is assayed by these fishermen. You know, fishing is my passion. I started this job when I was 18. It was good, but we have many problems caused by the arrival of these foreign fishing boats. And now we start to assist the scarcity of fish. This state, if untamed, will make the livelihood of these many fishermen a bit unbearable. Majority of fishermen in Senegal consider now fishing is not what it was before. Because when some of them think that it's the scarcity of fish, others say that only the foreign boat vessels are responsible for this lake of fish. Reporting for Ebru Africa in Senegal, I'm Elaj Galaifai. Moving to North Africa, a new round of peace talk between Libya's warring factions has kicked off in Geneva, with all parties showing a constructive spirit. 
Now, during the first round of the UN-mediated discussions in the Swiss city earlier this month, the warring factions from the country agreed on a roadmap to form a unity government. The United Nations opened a second round of political talks over Libya in Geneva and played down the absence of a key faction, saying only the site of talks was a point of contention. Four years after Muammar Gaddafi's fall, Libya has two rival governments, one internationally recognized and the other set up by a faction that has taken over Tripoli, who are locked in a conflict Western powers fear will slide into civil war. The UN wants the rival factions to forge a unity government and end hostilities. The internationally recognized government and some of its opponents are represented at the talks. But the main rival government based in Tripoli has refused to attend. Mohamed Shoaib, first vice president of the Libyan parliament, called for the international community to put pressure on the groups. More pressure on all the fanatic people throughout the countries. This is, this is my, my request from all the international community to exert more pressure on all fanatic people, whether in the east or the west. Some factions have declared partial ceasefire before the first round of talks, but sporadic clashes have continued. I think today we are going to discuss the criteria and how to establish a national reconciliation government. The criteria and the conditions, you see, whether it will be big one, small, uh, cover all the area of Libya or not. This is, uh, this is our discussion, the criteria and how to establish the government. The latest gathering hosted by the UN support mission in Libya is a follow-up to a meeting held in the Swiss city last week when stakeholders expressed commitment to a united and democratic Libya governed by the rule of law and respect for human rights. Moving to international news, Turkish police have detained 26 security officers on suspicion of illegally wiretapping politicians, civil servants and businessmen. Here are the details. The chief prosecutor's office in the western coastal city of Izmir carried out the raids according to Dogan, a privately owned national news service. Prosecutors were not immediately available for comment. Erdogan accuses critics of setting up a parallel state within the Turkish administration and trying to topple him, blaming his supporters within the police and judiciary for a corruption inquiry that dropped the government late in 2013. Now, in the course of the scandal, apparently incriminating wiretap recordings of the then prime ministers, ministers and other senior officials were leaked onto the internet. Erdogan has cast the investigations, which led to the resignation of three ministers as a coup attempt, and in response he had thousands of police officers, judges and prosecutors removed from their posts. So that wraps it up for Ebru African News this afternoon. Join me at 8.30 p.m. for our primetime bulletin and a much more comprehensive look at what's happening in the world today. I'm Kamena Gore. It was an absolute pleasure to have you here with us as we took a short look at what happened in the world thus far. For myself and the entire Ebru Africa family, we're wishing you an absolutely lovely, blessed and productive Tuesday afternoon. <laughs>